what is anxiety, and how do you know that anxiety is holding you back? Now, to be clear, anxiety is not a flaw, it's not a weakness, it's not a sign that there is something wrong with you. Anxiety is a natural emotion that we are all capable of creating. And we also all are capable of uncreating it. It's probably a very old emotion that while we are living, while we were living in, in caves during the Stone Ages or even before, preserved us, helped us to make it through because anxiety warned us if there was a sable-toothed tiger or any other potential predators that could make our life difficult. So evolution preserved anxiety all the way to now. So rather than saying anxiety is your foe, just keep in mind that anxiety has a purpose, has a reason to exist. Now, anxiety is either, you can look at it from both sides, created by your brain, especially the midbrain, the limbic system, the amygdala, these anxiety cores in your brain, or, which I find much more empowering, you can look at it that anxiety is created by your mind. Now, if you divide the mind in two, there is a conscious mind, and then there is a subconscious mind. It is that subconscious, illogical mind that is responsible for our feelings, and also, therefore, for anxiety. Why? Now, how often do you feel that anxiety shows up at the most inopportune moments? At times when you really shouldn't be anxious, your second date, or maybe you have an interview for a job, or you meet for the first time the in-laws, whatever it is, you want to be cool, calm, collected, and then the anxiety takes over. Yes, there may be some threat, but in the end, it doesn't really make sense to be anxious when it actually creates the opposite of you wanting to shine. And therefore, it is not a conscious decision to create the emotion. It is actually something subconsciously that gets triggered, that activates us to feel anxiety. But what's important is that don't hate on your anxiety, because if you do that, you would actually also probably hate your smoke detector or your burglar alarm. Now, both of them may go off when there is no smoke, no fire, or no one has entered into the house, and you wonder, well, why does it go off? So maybe I should change the battery, or maybe I have to alter the setting. Well, that's the same thing we should think about when we have anxiety. What is it what sets the anxiety off, even though we intellectually know there shouldn't be really any reason, especially no reason from the past. There is no predator necessarily waiting outside the door trying to attack us. So what's going on? But these are the questions we usually don't answer, uh, ask ourselves and don't really find answers for because we are so kept in that uh, feeling of discomfort and that feeling of uh, paralysis because of the intensity of anxiety. Now, but you have to admit, a smoke detector who would sound like a chirping little bird, you easily would ignore. And the same with your phone. I mean, your ringtone is probably chosen so that you can listen to it and not ignore it. Igni anxiety cannot be ignored. It shouldn't be ignored. And that's why it is so intense. What has been missing for us is the understanding on what's the message. It's clear with all these alarm systems what they try to tell you, but what is actually anxiety trying to tell us when it goes off? Especially when we know there shouldn't be really anything to worry about. That is the million dollar question that I will help you to find the answer for later in the series. But how do you know in the first place that anxiety is holding you back? Now, 
if you live in a small comfort zone, if you notice that because you feel so easily uneasy and insecure, anxious, stressed, and therefore you avoid, avoid social settings, avoid maybe trying something new, avoid taking risks, and your life has been more and more shrinking to the size of your house or your apartment or maybe your bedroom, well, you know that the anxiety has been holding onto you with a pretty tight grip and your comfort zone has become, in some ways, your prison because you are too scared to get out. You also know that if you are becoming hypervigilant, if you're over planning, if you are micromanaging, overly controlling because you don't want to leave anything up to chance, that can be also a form of anxiety running your life. And you can even feel that the anxiety is the one that is the fuel for your actions if you are pleasing everyone and always worried about what other people may be thinking about you and therefore never really feel completely secure and calm within yourself. Now, these are ways we have been learning to deal with anxiety. Now, usually when people are talking about what holds them back with anxiety, these are the, the symptoms, heart racing, mind racing, feeling that uh, somehow they are very tense and tight and cannot think straight. And all those things are true, absolutely. But I think what's much more overlooked how anxiety impacts is, is how it pushes us into these coping modes or survival modes and, and makes our lives basically just about somehow feeling safe, somehow avoiding rejection, somehow gaining some little sense of approval to not feel that we don't belong. All of those things can, for a while, make us feel, okay, we can survive, we can keep on going, but at the end, it's incredibly stressful to always live in these, what I call, avoidance or pleasing modes, and it takes a lot of energy. So lo and behold, because it is so stressful and it is really draining, you may start to self-medicate. You may drink too much, take too many drugs, smoke too much weed, and eventually you may feel that without those self-medications, you cannot really cope anymore. And that's where the physical symptoms come in. The physical symptoms can be insomnia, chronic pain, high blood pressure, irregular heartbeat, inflammation, weight gain or weight loss, all those things are signs that the anxiety is a problem. But for you as a baseline, simply ask yourself, what drives you to do what you do during the day? And also, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as centered and grounded within yourself? Do you see yourself as your own authority, your own leader for your life? Or is there constantly more a worry, a fear, an anxiety and insecurity that makes you ultimately how you perceive your identity? And if you feel, I'm an anxious person, that's who I am, then you're dead wrong and it's even more important for you to listen to this series and to get some help to break through anxiety and grow from it. Now, the second question is, is anxiety not just a biochemical problem, an imbalance in your neurotransmitters in the brain, especially serotonin? Well, it's a fair question because, as we know, there are these anti-anxiety medications that do help that do make you feel better. So wouldn't that mean that the anxiety is just that? As soon as your neurotransmitters are back in a certain kind of equilibrium, well, the anxiety is gone, so that's, that's that. I find it's a little bit like the chicken and the egg question. So yes, anxiety can cause these imbalances in the brain, but 
are the imbalances now an effect of the anxiety or are they the cause, the root cause of anxiety? I think they are much more the former. And here's why. Because even though people do take their anti-anxiety medications, what doesn't necessarily change is how they think and how they act and how they perceive themselves. Their emotions may be nicely on a more, let's say, neutral place. Often people on medication don't necessarily feel anything very strong anymore, also those positive emotions, but it doesn't mean that they have grown or changed. Let's say pain. Let's say you have a tummy ache and you would say, well, the the tummy ache has activated inside of me these receptors, these neuroreceptors that are detecting pain. And let's give pain medication to stop these receptors from acting. Sounds great, right? But in the end, maybe you don't have pain anymore, but whatever caused the pain isn't gone. Whether it's your appendix or a stomach ulcer, you still need to address this. Just making the pain more comfortable or go away doesn't mean that whatever caused the pain in the first place is resolved. And that is the same with anxiety. There is something underneath that makes this anxiety activate, that makes the anxiety pipe up and say, hey, pay attention. And that is something that we cannot address just with a biochemical uh, response. Pharmaceuticals don't make you resolve these root causes but they can make it easier to get there. And so I always tell people, if you feel that your anxiety doesn't allow you to think straight or feel even motivated to work on yourself, please take medication to take the edge off, but then make also commitment to yourself to resolve the anxiety at the root and not just cover up the symptoms. The third question is, is anxiety caused by hidden suppressed trauma? And the answer is sure, sometimes yes. And so people wonder, do I need to find out what the trauma was all about? Do I need to somehow investigate the deepest, deepest layers of my subconscious and then unearth that maybe abuse or whatever confusion was happening early in my life? And there the answer is maybe. Sometimes it helps, but sometimes it can also be a quest that is prolonging the struggle with anxiety and holding you back from starting your healing process. Let me explain. The subconscious, as I mentioned before, the deeper part of the mind, is keeping track of everything that ever happened to us, even before the conscious mind was really even developed. So in the womb, trauma that can happen there is registered and also, you know, somehow put into this memory library of the subconscious mind. Of course, we don't necessarily recall how it was six or seven months in the womb, even anything happening before the age of two is kind of hard consciously. But the subconscious remembers, and the subconscious, depending on the severity of the trauma, is putting those traumas into, let's say, certain drawers or bags that keep it keeps firmly closed until we seem to be ready to deal with it. What happens, though, even though there was suppressed memory, that we are acting according to that trauma, meaning we are maybe more cautious, more in a sense of defense mode. Maybe we have more the beliefs of we are small and powerless and the world is a very hostile and dangerous place, and we don't even know why we feel that. And those are the moments where uh, people describe then that they have been living in this anxiety for a long time and then they had an acupuncture treatment or uh, they had uh, a yoga class or just spontaneously the, the trauma came out of them. Like 
dislodged from the cellular memory. And all of a sudden they realized, oh my God, this happened to me when I was a baby. Sometimes, unfortunately, they wonder if it was true or if they are just making it up, which is very common. And I can only reassure you, if you have this memory coming up and it's consistently coming up, you should take it serious and not just, you know, put it aside as some kind of a terrible fiction. But the subconscious, again, may hold on to the memory and suppress it until you feel ready. So if you are anxious and you're saying, well, I need to address already anything that makes me anxious, even if I don't know what the trauma is, and I need to address already how I think and the beliefs I'm holding on to that are probably beliefs that are not accurate anymore, and I need to change my behavioral patterns. If you do all those things, what will happen is that your subconscious will see, oh, you are actually ready. There is actually a more competent, confident, trustworthy adult emerging. So I guess now I can show you what happened. And sometimes it may not even be necessary to really go back and, and understand all those memories and all those uh, significant events that may have occurred, but the subconscious felt it wasn't really time to share. So to make a long answer short, yes, there are hidden traumas, hidden memories, but the journey to overcome anxiety doesn't depend on discovering or unearthing them. The journey just starts already with what you know your anxiety has been feeling uh, since then and what you know how the anxiety has been showing up and sending you messages and how you responded to them and all those things are already giving you plenty of room to work on and whether eventually whatever has been hidden comes out or not don't feel there is something missing if you don't know and don't feel like well i never really knew what happened so i'm not fully whole that is not true and that is certainly in the eye of the beholder so know that we don't have to know everything that our subconscious knows but we have to show our subconscious and i will get more into this later that we are the source of safety and are no longer this helpless and defenseless as we used to be at the time of the trauma question number four how can I identify what triggers my anxiety? Now, isn't that true, right? I mean, you wake up in the morning and the first thing you're feeling is, oh, here it is again. The anxiety is almost sitting next to you by the bedside, ready to pounce as soon as you open your eyes. And Often people describe this form of anxiety, free floating anxiety. It's just like either coming out of the blue or it's this undercurrent of anxiety that seems to always be there, like uh, the annoying noise of, of a refrigerator or someone you know, 24 seven uh, using the weed whacker outside of your window. Anxiety can really make you feel that there is really nothing that triggers it. It's just a constant there. Well, that's not necessarily true. Because when you really look at what you have been thinking right before you were anxious, you may notice that it all started with some random worry, a random thought that just uh, out of the blue has been popping up. And then that thought, it's like a small one, like a little bubble, becomes eventually bigger. So let's say you have been worrying about one of your children and it was just this first little thought about, well, I wish she would uh, actually get a real job. And then it gets a little bit bigger. Well, what if she doesn't get a real job? And I also feel like she doesn't have your daughter, 
doesn't have a consistent relationship and then it gets a little bit bigger. Why does she not have a consistent relationship? Maybe it's just this uh, uh, dysfunction from our own uh, family that she took on. And it's probably that uh, we all imprinted this you know, negative mindset or this belief of not being good enough or being lovable into her and then it goes bigger and say that means she will probably always struggle and end up alone and that means we have failed and that could be a very nice little bubble that exploded eventually into this overwhelming mind construct that goes so fast that you may not even notice it. There may be this ping pong fleeting thoughts going on and all you notice is the anxiety that comes in response to it. Now, one of the exercises I always tell people to do when they're starting the journey with anxiety is to write down their negative thoughts. And I know it is not very pleasant to see uh, black and white what's going on in our head and often people say well I'm thinking like you want me to focus on the negative and I'm saying yes thank you that's exactly what I want because I want you to see how your mind works what does it chew on what does it feel focused or gravitate towards and writing it down doesn't mean that you get stuck with it but actually you can gain a certain distance from it. You can see a little bit more clearly, wow, these are the topics that over and over come to mind. These are the same themes that somehow I feel you know, gravitating towards. No wonder if that's what's going on in my mind, I feel anxious. Now, when I was dealing with anxiety, my most common negative thought was the what if. And it was always a what if, a what if around me doing something wrong, a what if making a mistake when I worked uh, in cardiology about a patient, or what if my boss uh, doesn't give me another contract, or then it was about the relationship, what if I'm cheated on, or whatever those what ifs are, completely irrational, but making a scenario that made me feel a quite small and out of control and b i couldn't really trust other people to have my best interest in mind those were the two themes that seemed to repeat themselves just in different scenarios and colors so i could learn a lot from them because what i could learn is that underneath those thoughts were beliefs and those beliefs came from uh, certain events and certain uh, uh, early imprints that I needed to address in order for me to be able to change the beliefs and then also to change how I think and how I uh, see the world. But that is like, you know, you're looking at a tree and you're seeing only the branches out there and you have to follow them all the way down to the stem and the roots to really see what's going on with the tree. And so those emotions, you could say, are on the outside, the anxiety. You go a little bit further inside, then you see, oh yeah, they are connected to the branches of those negative thoughts. And then eventually you see, whoa, those are the beliefs that actually make those uh, thoughts even come up. And and then deeper inside, this is what really happened and what made those beliefs, uh, you know, uh, come into uh, the, the subconscious in the first place. So don't be afraid of your negative thoughts. Write them down. The other thing that helps you to find the triggers are the situations. Just notice, are there certain people? Are there certain contexts in your life? Is it, uh, you know, when you're more among a lot of people or when you're more one-on-one -on -one or when you are alone? Also, what happens in the morning? Is there maybe something where you would say, <laughs> every morning when I wake up, I feel anxious. And then ask yourself, so what is actually the flavor of anxiety? Is it a flavor of worry or dread or stress or overwhelm or is it a feeling of uh, unworthiness just get a little bit more a sense of what is the undertone anxiety is 
such a big umbrella. And if you get more that specific flavor of anxiety, you can also more understand what the theme is, what's underneath it. So for example, if you wake up with anxiety and you ask yourself, so I'm feeling anxious because, and then you just wait for the bubble to come up, well, maybe the thought that comes up, well, I'm feeling overwhelmed. And then you can say, well, I'm feeling overwhelmed because. And then you may hear, well, I'm feeling overwhelmed because I have so much to do and I don't know where to start. And so those question and answers are really, really effective when it comes to gaining more insights on the triggers of where the anxiety comes from. Now, when you ask this, these questions, you know, what am I uh, feeling overwhelmed by or what am I dreading right now or what am I feeling pressured by, you don't necessarily get an answer in an instant. But if you just keep on asking and you're patiently waiting a little bit longer, what you're going to find out is that you get either a word or maybe just a sensation or an image coming up that tells you then this is really what's going on. It's a beautiful conscious subconscious communication that you can foster this way. And, you know, with any communication, it may take a little bit uh, time to get the hang of it, to, to feel that there is kind of a flow. But when you do it, man, your subconscious is more than happy to tell you anything that's going on and you can then learn from it and, and make some adjustments that we're going to address later on. It's also very helpful when you want to know the triggers of your anxiety to look at your dreams. What are the themes of my dreams? Do I feel chased? Do I feel stuck? Do I feel like I'm standing in front of a big void? Do I feel like that uh, my teeth are falling out? <laughs> I had this favorite dream of mine, not favorite, but <laughs> it was definitely one of those very common nightmares that I woke up. No, I woke up in the dream, so I was still sleeping, but I was sitting in the school bus and realized that I had no underwear on. And um, of course, any moment I was expecting people to find out and made fun of me. Well, I guess there it's pretty easy to interpret that dream. So just look at your dreams and get a little bit curious about them because your subconscious is talking with you. And it's also processing, of course, through the dreams. And if you have been dealing with anxiety, those recurring dreams may be actually a way for your subconscious to tell you, I need some help here. There are certain unresolved issues that we need to deal with. And of course, look into your past. You know, I had a client of mine who was a very successful entrepreneur, a happy father of two, a pillar in the community, and pretty much had anything and everything going for himself. He was in his prime. And he was also struggling chronically with anxiety. And he couldn't believe it. Why should I be anxious? I'm such a strong leader. I'm someone people look up to. I'm the life of the party. Why should I be anxious? And so he just thought, well, I'm going to face the anxiety by doing parachute jumps. That's pretty scary. That's something I always was afraid of. I'm going to sign up for 20 of those, and that's going to nip the anxiety in the butt. Well, after half of those 20 jumps, he realized that the anxiety actually had transmuted into chronic panic attacks. So it got even worse, and obviously his idea didn't work. So he needed to look more inside. And what he found is that the anxiety really came from that feeling that he didn't allow himself to be vulnerable. He didn't allow himself to show any kind of weaker emotions because he put so much pressure on himself to be and to play that persona that he felt 
was unshakable and strong and the rock for anybody else, that whatever was going on inside of him, he was hiding. And that is something where then when he looked into the past, he realized it came from the time when his mother, who had cancer when he was just 12 years old, uh, became weaker and weaker. And he was always kind of the sunshine for, for his mom. He realized no matter how many jokes he told, no matter how much he uh, was having straight A's in school, he couldn't save her. He could maybe make her smile, but he could not make her whole again. And and when she passed, he couldn't even look at her in her final moments. He had to leave the room and he just suppressed all this pain and also this disappointment in himself and this, this sense of shame and guilt because he obviously had let his mother down and and despite his best efforts, he had failed. And that, that feeling of failure and that fear of losing something again that was important to him and being completely powerless about that made him suppress everything that uh, happened in the past, all the grief and all these confusions and he decided to reconstruct himself into this super successful goal-getter who, you know, happened to be an overachiever and unfortunately also someone who was so afraid of whatever was still hidden in his heart. The anxiety made him realize, this is not all of who you are. This is not the whole story. And I talked about suppressed uh, emotions and suppressed memories before, well, in this case, he knew that he had suppressed it. It was him consciously pushing those memories and emotions aside. But at some point, the subconscious says, well, your life is going well, everything is okay. So I'm going to bring up some anxiety to make you realize that there is some work to do. There are some wounds to heal. There is something that you have for way too long ignored. And so look into your past and think about some significant events that you also may have felt like, well, that's so long. I don't really want to deal with this anymore. I have spoken about it. I actually went to therapy. It should be all good. But if you go back there and if you just, you know, put yourself into the shoes of who you were, and you still feel an emotion coming up or your body responding with tension or maybe with your heart racing, then you know it isn't totally gone. There is still something that your subconscious responds to. And that is a sign that, well, probably my subconscious is using that information from the past and is still somewhat extrapolating it to what happens now in the present moment. And that may be the reason why certain things scare me. Now, the simple example is like a phobia, right? I mean, if you have a phobia of, uh, let's say, a dog or maybe an elevator ride, well, you don't understand why. This is a little chihuahua, shouldn't be scary. Or the elevator, everyone knows you're totally safe, but you're still totally in complete uh, paralysis and maybe even panic when you think about having to pet a dog or going into an elevator. And then you go back into the past and you remember the time when you were little and a dog licked your face and you were so scared because you thought this dog going to eat you or you were locked in a cupboard by your mean sibling who wanted to play a trick on you and you were stuck there for hours and you thought you're going to suffocate. Well, that is the reason why you still are afraid of tight spaces or four-legged uh, canines. And that is something that's, you know, for many very clear that needs to be addressed because I don't want to live in this fear. But when it comes to this anxiety, there may be other things that may have happened. They're not necessarily then translated into a phobia, but maybe translated into a general sense of not feeling safe or a sense of uh, feeling exposed or a fear of rejection. 
those are the things that can really help you when you go back in time and look at what are those unresolved issues. And that brings me then to the podcast number two, which will be about how do we identify and heal the root causes of anxiety and what are they in the first place? So definitely stay tuned for this one too. And please like this video if you enjoyed the content and subscribe to this channel. I really appreciate it.